using inclusion-exclusion as kind of a generalized complement principle to solve problems that otherwise would defeat us, and then talk about the pigeonhole principle as a completely separate principle. It really is on its own. It sometimes gets connected up with other discrete ideas, but sometimes it doesn't. And I'm going to go through examples of the pigeonhole principle starting from the most trivial to some of the more subtle, and that'll be a separate topic about a half hour at the end of today's lecture. Hopefully we'll be able to finish with that. So what I want to do now to begin my intro to inclusion-exclusion is go back to Chris's question yesterday. Chris said, we, yesterday we talked about putting distinct objects into distinct boxes. It was this kind of a problem. Let's say we have uh, five dollar bills. In each one, we can buy a cookie, and there's two types of cookies to buy. So we want to distribute our five dollar bills into either cookie box one or cookie box two. This is equivalent, remember, to let's repeatedly select five cookies from two types. Same problem. Distribute five single dollars into two distinct boxes, cookie one, cookie two, or choose as five cookies from two types of cookies. Same problem. Here's another way to look at it. Uh, I have two numbers, x plus one, x1 and x2, and I want these to equal five. Okay, this will be cookie one, this will be cookie two. So how many solutions are there to this equation? Yeah, Rob. Are, are you building up to the, to the dollars being distinct from each other? No, I'm not going to build up to that. Isn't that distinct objects, distinct boxes, when the boxes are not identical and the dollars are not identical? I meant non-distinct into distinct. Oh. I'm already non-distinct. Okay. I said it wrong. Thanks, Rob. Um, now i got to go back and make sure I said it right or wrong. Sorry. This is distributing non-distinct objects, the dollar bills, into distinct boxes. The same as selecting with repetition this many items from this many types. Thank you. I said it wrong. Now I said it right. There is distinct into distinct, but that was before. That was a generalized permutation. That's not this. Okay, questions? All right. It's also the same as the number of solutions to this equation. Choose a number for cookie one. Choose a number for cookie two. They have to add up to five. And we saw this yesterday. This is not new. We did this. And we showed that what we're really doing here is taking, taking $5 bills and dividing them into, into two parts, right? And to do that, to divide them into two parts, we put a little squiggle sign. And that squiggle sign could go anywhere. Here, 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 here. And I think that's what made Chris ask the next question. Now I'm going to change this. There's three kinds of cookies. So now I get two squiggles. OK? And I'm going to write down all the different ways I can do this. There's 10 of them. So I got here are my $3. And I'm going to divide these into three different parts. Here's the first way I can divide them. That means 0, 0, 3. Okay? Here's the next way. Here's the next way. Here's the next way. Okay, those are four ways. There's more. Let's write a few more down. Uh, I'm doing this in a very particular order. I'm starting with them both at the left, and then I move the right one over one at a time. And then when I use all those up, I'm moving the left one over one, and then I'm moving the right one over one at a time. So what's left? X, X, squiggle, yes. Squiggle, X. X, X, squiggle, X, squiggle. X, 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 squiggle, squiggle. It's the discrete math dance that Jeff Radcliffe was doing before. Now that you made that three, should that be a three up top, or am I not understanding something? Three dollars, three cookies. 
equals 3. You are understanding something. Surprise. <laughs> Thank you. How many altogether? 10. We worked this through yesterday. It's $3. That means 3x's. Three different cookies, so we're going to divide these into three different areas. That means we need two squiggles to divide it up into three different areas. So it's 3 plus 3 minus 1. Choose, and then we get to decide where we want to put these two squiggles. Five places, where are you going to put the two squiggles? We can put them in the first two. 1 and 3, 1 and 4, 1 and 5. It's 5, choose 2. And the general rule is this plus this minus 1, choose the number of cookies minus 1. Okay, this is what we did yesterday. This is review. Are there questions about it? <clears throat> Teresa? Why do you need to keep those two squiggles together? Why is that because this represents having none of the first cookie, none of the second cookie, and three of the last cookie. Uh, zero right, right. It shows that there are none in the second category. And this represents one of the first cookie, none of the second cookie, two of the third cookie. And actually, that's going to get right into Chris's question, and we'll get in a second. Yeah, Gary? Is it just a coincidence that this looks like a triangle number? <coughs> no, it's not coincidence at all. I mean, it's, this, is, this is something choose two. So something choose two, you know, is always triangle numbers. It's the, f the first one with all the rest. That's four. Okay, and then you can't use that one again, so it's the next one, which is three choices with all the rest, and then two and then one. So it's not coincidental. No, it's completely because of that. All right, so the answer is 10 here, but Chris asked this question. He said, look, it seems to me that, you know, say you have like eight of these dollar bills, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and if you want to divide these into, uh, into three parts, you really just want to insert a divider into one of nine places, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And... If you want to insert 2 in there, then it's 9 choose 2. Here's 1. Here's the other one. There's only 9 places you can put it. And then he said, oh, and I'll handle the situation where you have these two together. I'll just you know, say I'll put them on top of each other. Right? So Chris said, how come that isn't a good way to do it? And the truth is, it is a fine way to do it. But if you count how many ways there are for Chris to do that, it turns out also to be 10 choose 2 and not 9 choose 2. And it's specifically because when he says let's double them up, that adds possibilities that he already has not counted yet, or he already has counted yet. Let me show you. Let's look at this and convert each of these to, to Chris's notation. So I'll check the ones that looks exactly like the way Chris would do it, or I'll circle them. This one. These look exactly like the way Chris would write them. They're exactly the same as the way I wrote mine. The ones that look different are these. Now, if Chris is choosing two spots out of how many spots are in here? One, two, three. One, two, th one, two, three, four. Four choose two. He's got six different ways of choosing those two spots. And here they are. These are all of Chris's possibilities if he counts four choose two. So all of these, where he counts this and puts them double, are situations that have to be added and counted separately. So what Chris is really saying to do He's saying, I want to count it this way. And I'm saying, that's fine, Chris, but then you have to do, call this n. You have to do n minus 1 choose 2 plus n. And that's the same as just n choose 2. Does that make sense? The count, yeah. Okay, in the right. And, what's, and you would see this even more if you had more, more, dividers. more dividers. With more dividers, suddenly there's a lot more that you've missed or that, you've, that you haven't counted, or that you've counted twice in some way. Because these wouldn't be in yours at all, and you'd have to add in a lot more. It wouldn't just be n you'd be adding. You'd be adding more of an n squared calculation. So if you counted it your way, the calculation would be much more complicated, but you could get the right answer. And it's probably better just to think of it this way. And that's why everybody thinks of it this way. Is that good? All right, so this is going to lead us to the next question. Here's the same kind of problem. You got three... Uh, different cookie jars, and you want to buy a bunch of cookies. Each one costs a buck, and you have $8. So you want to take your $8 and, and split them into three different categories. But, well, let's solve it first. Let's solve it if we don't have any constraints. What would the answer be? 
Eight plus two plus one less than this. That's ten. Choose two. There are ten choose two is ten times nine divided by two. Forty-five different ways of filling in these x's. Eight plus three minus one. That's ten. Choose two. You have eight x's, two squiggles. How many different ways are there to put those squiggles in the ten places? This many. But now I've added these two constraints. This does not make the problem much harder. Let's think about it. If I added these two constraints, so it looks like this. x1, x2, x3. And I insist that x1 has to have at least three dollars in it. Okay? So here's a dollar bill, and here's a dollar bill, and here's a dollar bill. And x3 has to have at least one dollar in it. Here's a dollar bill. If I insist on these constraints, then I start my problem out looking like this. And now the question is, how many ways are there to finish up? Well, now I only have four dollars. I have no restriction at all on my x1, x2, x3, just like I had in my original problem. So I have four dollars and three categories. So it's going to be this new problem without any constraints. The constraints are now gone. When you get constraints like this, that xi's have to be bigger than some number, it hardly affects the problem at all. You just add up these numbers, take them away from your total, and do the problem with a new total. So what would the answer be? It would be 4 plus 2, which is 6. Choose 2. And that is... Uh, 12. 12? 15. 6 times 5 divided by 2. Okay, are there questions about this? Yes, Rob? Is there anything... <coughs> much different that gets introduced if you had like a ceiling restriction on one of the cookie jars? That's what we're going to do right now. Before we do that? Yes. Can you just refresh my memory of why? It doesn't seem like we're adding back in our bills that are in X1 and X3. I mean, don't, don't we have to say something about how many choices there were to get those three bills into X1 and, and the one into X3? We do, but there's only one. The order doesn't matter here. You don't care what order you put these dollar bills in. You just because they're all indistinguishable. So we only care how big X1 is at the end. So if X1 has to start out at 3 and X3 has to start out at 1, the question is, okay, that's fixed. Well, what can I do from here? And uh, if I did care about the order of the dollar bills, then I'd have to do some counting before I started. Yeah. In a way, we don't even care how big the stacks are, or we'd have to add them in back in. Like we're just we're just calculating numbers of ways. <clears throat> how many possible ways can it be? How many possible different ways can you give a number to x1, x2, and x3 so that they add up to 8? So you don't even really have to record that there's 3 and 1 and 1 and 3 before you start your calculation. Because, because we're not trying to get it. If I'm going to go on, I don't care. If I'm, I could erase these and just change that number to 4 and then, right. Well, if, the, if the question is what's the probability that x1 is going to have 6 bills yeah, or more, right. then you'd have to keep track. Yeah. Right. Well, what about if you constrain the same instead like x1 plus x3 greater than equal to 4 and then... That's harder. Yeah, so you kind of do it the same way as you No, did, right? no. We're going to do something that's kind of just what Rob asked a second ago, and, and he said, what happens if it's less than something? We're going to do examples of these. It's very hard to count directly how many ways there are to find values for x1, x2, and x3, which equal 8, when x1 has to have less than 3. Here's one way to do it. We can just divide it up into cases. If x1 is less than 3, then x1 could be 0, x1 could be 1, and x1 could be 2. Well, if x1 is 0, then we have a problem of two variables equaling 8. And you can do that. How many ways are there to split two variables to equal 8? You can do that in your head, actually, without even using the formula. There's nine different ways, right? And how many different ways are there? This is the ad addition rule, right? Because these are in completely disjoint cases. If x is 1, then ha there are how many for the other two? If x is 1 is 1, that means you've got x2 and x3 have an equal 7. So they're 8, right? And then this one would be 7. So the answer to this you can do in this direct way. 17 and 7 is 24. But there's another way you can do it. And this other way you can do it is going to work for more difficult problems. And it's the complement way. Instead of looking at x1 less than 3, we're going to look at things where x1 is 
not less than three, right, when it's greater than or equal than three, and they'll just take those away from, from the total number of solutions. Well, the total number of solutions we know is 10 choose two. How many solutions are there where x1 is bigger than or equal to three? We just did that before. If x1 is bigger than or equal to three, then this turns down to five, right? And we get seven, choose two. And that's the answer, and that better be 24. This is 45, and this is 21. So it's the same. Two different ways of solving the problem. Two different principles. Could you just, my mind blink for a second? Could you just mm. hate that one out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my friends and I call that a brain fart. <laughs> yes. You can still speak, it's okay. <laughs> You don't have to say excuse me for a brain fart. Right? Could you just explain that 10 through minus 7, please? Yes. This is the total number of solutions to this original problem. And these are the solutions where x1 is bigger than or equal to 3. So when you subtract, you get the solutions to x1 less than 3. We did a problem like this before. We did base 10 numbers that have at least one zero. How do we do that? How do we do base 10 numbers that have at least one zero? We did, yeah, Rob. You took one digit off, and then you did a combinatorial on base 9 for the rest Exactly, right. We said that here are all the base 10 numbers. Let's subtract off all the base 10 numbers that don't have any zeros in them. The remainder will be the ones that have at least one zero in them. How many base 10 numbers don't have any zeros in them? It's like base 9 numbers. And that's what we got. That's when you just want to exclude no zeros. That's when you want to have things that have at least one zero. But now I've made it harder. Now I want numbers that have at least a zero and at least a one. Why can't I just go ahead and say, okay, well, I took off all the ones with zeros, and now I'm going to take off all the ones with no ones. Why is that wrong? Right, because they overlap. This is an important idea. That's why inclusion-exclusion theorem comes into play. Because the normal complement has no overlap. But sometimes complements overlap, and when they do, that's when you have to use inclusion-exclusion. So let me present this now from scratch as an inclusion-exclusion problem. We're going to solve this by doing all base 10 numbers minus minus the ones that have at least a zero and at least a 1 there. That's what I meant. I'm going to take all base 10 numbers minus those that are not the ones that have at least one zero and at least one 1. Is, is, is that the same? That's the same as, as this. At least one 0 and at least one 1 without the base 10 numbers? Minus the complement of these. The, the line on top is the complement. Well, if you can describe to me the complement of these, then I could have written that down. But it's not just the ones that have that have no zeros. Or let's see what it is. This equals all base ten numbers. You all know this. You can all just do it logically. But remember this from set theory. A intersect B. Complement equals what? Not A, union, not B. So now I'm going to rewrite that. Not the first one. This and is intersection, so not the first one, which means it doesn't have at least one zero. That means it has no zeros. Okay, so no zeros or union or no ones. I did that just to remind you that set theory isn't a complete waste of time. I mean, it does come up. It just comes up unconsciously sometimes. We're taking away the complement of this. The complement of this turns an intersection into a union. The reason I'm doing this slowly also is to force you to see that you have to use inclusion-exclusion. Inclusion-exclusion is a way to count things that are union together. It's a way to count things that are this, or this, or this, or this. That's when you get the overlaps. 
Here's inclusion exclusion for two things. If you want to count the union of two sets, it's the size of the first plus the size of the second minus the size of their intersection. Let's use that theorem over here. Base 10 numbers are 10 to the n. How many base 10 numbers have no zeros? 9 to the n. How many base 10 numbers have no 1s? 9 to the n. How many base 10 numbers have no zeros and no 1s? A intersect B. This and this. That's the overlap. That's the part we counted twice that we need to subtract off. A to the n, right. No zeros or ones means you only have eight symbols left. That's the right answer. We said no zeros or no ones. You're saying expands out according to the inclusion exclusion? A union B. If you want to know how many things are in here, well, that is a union. Okay. or is union and is intersection. Right? Well, again, like last time, we could split this up into cases. The cases where you know, you have two A's and, and choosing them first. And you, you could do this directly, but we're going to do it indirectly using the inclusion exclusion. We're going to get the total solutions, which is what we just mentioned, and subtract from them the complement of our constraint. What's the complement of our constraint going to be? It's permutations of these letters which which do have, right, and that means if they do, the three that go together could either be A or B or C, and that's where the inclusion-exclusion comes in. Anytime you use a complement trick, which gives you a union of possibilities, that's when you have to go back and resort to inclusion-exclusion to finish your idea. So I'm going to write down um, three A's, union, three B's, union, three C's. And make a note to yourself, because if you look at it later, you'll forget what this means. This means all strings that have three consecutive A's in them. This means all strings that have three consecutive B's in them. All strings that have three consecutive C's in them. A, B, C, minus A intersect B, A intersect C, A intersect B intersect C, thank you. Plus, uh, so, all right, now you tell me, and, and feel free to completely argue with my choice here, but would you rather right now have been taught the inclusion-exclusion theorem for the very first time, and then after that side 45 minutes come back to this, or would you have rather already known this when you saw set theory and then just have me do it now? Because I thought it's better to do it before. Yeah. Right? Now you see it now, right? All right. So this Anthony asks us the beginning. He goes, well, you know, this is a really good book, and I agree. And you're like, why don't you just, like, go in the order? Well, I think his choice here just stinks. I think it's just a bad choice. I think he really should have done inclusion and exclusion in the set theory chapter. And maybe in addition five, if enough people tell him that, he'll move that section over there. But there's lots of situations here where it just isn't obvious where to put the section. And I think here it doesn't belong so much in counting as much as it belongs back in set theory. And then you just refer to it again. Let's figure this out. Do you need to complement on this? No, no, no. I took the complement of this. I skipped a step. I took the complement in my head and just wrote this down. It's, it's minus the complement of the things without three consecutive same letters. That complement is the things with three consecutive same letters. Okay, so I just did that step without writing it down to you. Okay, well, let's do this piece by piece. Let's take this, just this part here, and break it up into pieces. The first piece is the number of things just in this set, the things with three A's. How many are there? Six. Remember what this means. This means there's, different, there's six different ways to order three A's, but that's not what this is measuring. This is measuring how many strings are there that have, that have three consecutive A's in them. What does that mean? If there have to be three A's coming together, 
then why don't we glue them together? Just like Baruch was saying. Right, let's think of them as one. So how many items do we have now to move around? Seven. Seven. And what are the different types? Three, three, and one. Good. Isn't it nice to have some tools, to have some ABCs? We wouldn't have known that this was helpful if we didn't know how to do problems like that. But we know, so we can continue to the next step. 3Bs is similar and 3Cs is similar, so it's just going to be three of these. I've taken care of this part. Now let's take care of the next part. 3As and 3Bs. That means I have only five objects. One a chunk of A's, one a chunk of B's, and then three distinct C's that can move around. So I'm going to take five objects, and the different types are three factorial, one, and one. And I have three of those possibilities. One, two, three. Three different pairs of things that go together. Finally, plus, if they all have to be So that means there's three possibilities. There's one of each type. That's it. Doesn't seem right. Are there really six possibilities to arrange? So they could only be three. Yeah, all the A's come first, and then B and C. A, C, B. B. It's like how do you what are the permutations of three elements? Exact same thing. Okay. Right, good. Well, I don't know, what, did I do the answer here? No, you did right. No, no, but did I write? I didn't write the answer down in this problem, so I have no idea what this turns out to be, but this is the right answer. You do this, you subtract off all of this. Keep in mind that this is equivalent to this bracketed part. Okay, that's not the whole thing here. That's just the part after the minus sign. So the minus goes through that. So the minus will have to go through that, right, and you're going to end up subtracting this, adding this, and subtracting that. Remember, in this problem, when you have the less than criteria, it's hard to count. If I want to find out the number of solutions to this equation, when each of these has to be less than 1, 2, and 3 respectively, that's a tricky problem. So we're going to do it by complement. We'll take all the solutions to this, which we know again is 10 choose 2. The total number of solutions is 10 choose 2. We want to subtract from that the solutions that don't have this criterion, the complement of these. Now this is supposed to mean ands, right? This and this and this. So if I complement it, I get what? Reverse it. So x1 is bigger than, not greater than or equal, but strictly bigger than 1, or x2 is strictly bigger than 2, or x3 is strictly bigger than 3. This is, again, from the Morgan's Law. If I run a not through here, all the conditions change parity, and the ends change into ors. But now I've got a set of conditions that have ors between them. So to count those up, I need the inclusion-exclusion theorem. And that's what we're going to do. OK, so far? OK, good. Let's work with this piece. Let's do the A and the B and the C part first. How many solutions to this have x1 strictly bigger than 1? Who remembers how to do that? If it's strictly bigger than 1, that means it has to be at least, at least 2, right? So if there's 2 in there, that means there's only 6 left here that you have to get. So it's 6 plus. 6 plus 2, choose, I just make 8. 8 choose 2. Now let's do the B case. x2 has to be bigger than 2. What's that going to be? 7 choose 2. Good. And the next one, x3 bigger than 3, is going to be 6 choose 2. Now let's do the double cases. What about when x has to be bigger than 1 and x2 has to be bigger than 2? That means x1 has to be at least 2 and x2 has to be at least 3. 
That means I have how many left? I have three left here, so it's three plus two, choose two. So it's five, choose two. What's the next one? X1, X3. Four, choose two, right? Minus, what's the next one? Two, three. That's three, choose two. Good. You guys are doing this fast in your heads. It's not obvious. And now finally, we have the, uh, the case where they all have to be. What's that going to be? Four, three, eight, eight. Leave zero. Wait, that's nine. That's nine used up. Four, three, two, nine. Right? So that leaves negative. So this is just a zero. Make this a zero. Everybody agree? There's no way to add up positive numbers to add up to negative one. So. I, I got a funny feeling about that, too. I agree. Um, I agree. I agree. There's something really fishy about this. Yeah, all right. So, so now that I can see what I actually did, what I actually did in all of these is that you see these equal signs here? They really met, they really should have been strictly, and these should have been equals, and then I don't think I get this problem, because that's the problem I really worked out in my notes. So I didn't work this problem out in my notes, and I'm not sure if it's going to work out evenly or not. I did work out the problem where these are equal signs and these are strict signs. If I switch them, it just changes the numbers by one. But, but if well, they're all obviously less you can't, than... Can hmm? You can't map, why did you map it to zero? I mean, you get negative, that's already indication that your setup already is off. It's messed up. Right, so... And well, I mean, I, I think it's okay. I mean, it means something. How many ways are there? How many solutions to this equation are there that have all three of these being true? And the answer is there aren't any. Right. So well, you could see so? way before that. Huh? Well, oh, no. Well, we still have all these. I mean, I'm not sure that... If you, look, if, you look, if you look at the statement of the problem... I agree. It doesn't look like there's any way to get there. There's no solution to it. Right, right, but, but we just got no solution to this subproblem. We still don't know that the whole thing's going to agree yet. I agree, I agree. A lot of them would turn out to be zero. Let's go ahead and check this. I'm not sure if it works out or not. Uh, it does work out to zero? So 10 choose 2 is going to be 45. Minus, what's this? Read them off. Minus twenty eight minus twenty one minus fifteen plus ten plus six plus three. So hope to God that turns out to be zero. It is, it's zero. Woohoo! There, one for the inclusion-exclusion theorem. So this is a perfectly fine way and a perfectly stupid way of doing this problem. If I gave you this problem on the exam and you said, oh, that's an inclusion-exclusion problem, and you just spent 20 minutes like I just did doing it, then you got your brain turned off. It's true, you should just look at this like Baruch said and said there's no way to do it. And you should. But I, don't, I think it's still a completely reasonable and worthwhile thing to work through this and see that it still works and gives you the right answer, even, it gives, even if it gives you it in a convoluted way. And I will change my notes next time. I'll probably do 3, 4, 5 rather than 1, 2, 3, or maybe not. I'm not sure if this is a good way to do it or not, but I think it's worthwhile. It still works. There's nothing wrong with what we did. We just get an answer the slow way instead of a fast way. You all come in with lunches. You give me all your lunches. I put them in a box. I hand them back out. I'm not malicious. I hand them back out in a random way. What's the chance all of you get somebody else's lunch, that nobody gets their own lunch back? Okay, that's the question. It's sometimes uh, written down as the hat check problem. Everybody checks their hats, they're given back randomly by a clueless hat check person, and what's the chance you get your own hat back? What's the chance nobody gets their own hat back? Yeah? Does this include giving more than one thing to any one person? Like, could you end up giving 35? No, everybody gets just one lunch back, except if it's their own, then that counts as as a non-derangement, but if it's not their own, if everybody doesn't get their own, it's a derangement. Okay. So there are n factorial ways of me giving back the lunches. It's just a way of ordering the lunches in a row and having you come and pick them up. 
n factorial ways. The question is how many of them are derangements? How many of them don't give you back the one you want? And we're going to solve this by complement. I'm going to subtract off the ones that are not derangements. Well, which ones are not derangements? Describe them to me in English. What makes a permutation a non-derangement? At, At least one person gets their lunch back. Okay. So it could be, uh, how do you want to divide these up into cases? Let's divide it up into unions of cases. There's lots of ways to do it. Here's a bad way. One person gets their lunch back. Two people get their lunch back. Three people get their lunch back. Exactly one, exactly two, exactly three. You all exactly get your lunch back. I can count some of those. The chance of you all getting your lunches back is one. The chance of one of you getting your lunch back. Well, any one of you could be the one that got their lunch back. That's 36 possibilities. And then the rest of you could get your lunches back in any way as long as, sorry, the rest of you could get your lunches in any way as long as as long as you don't get your own. But isn't that the same problem we're solving? Okay. Yeah. For 35. It's the arrangements for 35. So either we go down this route and make a recurrence equation, or we go another route. We're going to go another route. Okay? This route for the recurrence equation isn't a bad route, and it will teach you a lot of good stuff, but it's the wrong week. <laughs> so this week we're not going to do it. Instead, we're going to divide up the cases differently. Instead of saying one person gets their lunch back, two people get their lunch back, I'm going to divide it up into Chris gets his lunch back, Sharon gets her lunch back, all the permutations where Sharon gets her lunch back, all the permutations where Chris gets his lunch back. Now, this seems even worse, because Sharon can get her lunch back in permutations where a lot of you also get your lunch back. So how are you going to add these up? But here we can get the overlap taken care of by the inclusion-exclusion theorem. So let me write down the categories. Um, Shai? Yes? Just a, you know, typically, typically we actually steer away from, we go from the question of this type to the question where none, where actually one um, is mm. Here we are constructing it. Agree that you usually, right. The complement issue is, is sort of. Right, usually you like ands, and here you don't like ands. Here ands are hard. Um, you're right, good point to make. Um, I don't have any comment on it really, except that it's true. Is that really hard? It is really hard, right. You can't, it's hard to count this directly. And it really, this really is the only way people know how to count it easily. Yeah. All right, so let me write this down. I'm trying to figure out the best way to write it. But uh, this, th this is the list of things that are not derangements. So let's say, uh, let me list the people as, 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 say, P1 to Pn. Those are the people, right? So I'll say uh, P1 is fixed. That means P1 gets, gets his or her lunch back. This means all the permutations where P1 stays the same. Person 1 gets the lunch back. OK, everyone get that? Union, or P2 is fixed. Or PN, the nth person is fixed. We got to add up all the different permutations where this is true, or this is true, or this is true, or this is true. OK? Let's do it. Subtract all the intersections. Oh, geez. You can all. All the combinations of, of pairs plus all the combinations of triples minus all the combinations, et cetera, et cetera, dot, dot, dot. Go look this up in the book. It looks just that ugly. It's very hard to describe the generalized inclusion-exclusion theorem. How many permutations are there where I make sure that Sharon gets hers back? I don't give a hoot about what everybody else gets back, but she gets back her lunch. So I got, I got 36 lunches. I look for hers. OK, an apple and a cheese sandwich. Very good choice. Here it is. <laughs> and now I got the other 35 lunches, and I can just toss them out any way I want. How many ways are there to do that? N 35 factorial or n minus 1 factorial if I started with n. So this is n minus 1 factorial. Does everyone agree? Yeah. And so is that one. So how many do I got? N 
Yeah, but don't simplify things because you lose the pattern. How many ways were there for me to choose a single person out of you all? I chose Sharon at first, and I found n minus 1 factorial ways. But I could have chosen John, and I could have chosen Donna. And I see Jimmy, and I see... <laughs> I just want to do romper room. Um, <laughs> so, I got n choose 1. That's how many different people I can choose to fix. Single people to fix. And each one of those represents n minus 1 factorial permutations. Plus, next row, sorry, minus, next row. Now I'm fixing two people, and then I don't care what happens in the rest of them. So I can choose two people from n, and n choose two different ways. And then I get n minus 2 factorial. And I do this over and over again, and I hope you see the pattern. Wait, does p2 mean two people are fixed? Or is yes. A different person is fixed? It means two specific people are fixed. Sorry. No. no, it means person two is fixed. Oh, yeah. But I'm not up to here. This isn't this. Okay, we're still on. This row is this. It means person one and person two are fixed. Person one and person three are fixed. So there's n choose two things in this row, and each one is n minus two factorial. Okay? I'm sure everybody gets that. n choose one things in this row, n choose two things in this row, n choose three things in this row. The number of permutations with this criterion are n minus 2 factorial. The number with this criterion are n minus 3 factorial, because I fix three people and I have n minus 3 choices for the rest of you. I keep doing this until I get to the very last one. Now, the last one is either plus or minus, and I don't know what it is, so it depends what n is. If n is odd, it's going to be minus, and if n is even, it's going to be plus. So I write minus 1 to the n, and what goes there? n choose n times n minus n factorial. There it is. n factorial minus this mess. But this mess you can simplify with some algebra. And it simplifies to some really, really surprisingly, really cool answer. And that's why everybody puts this in books, because it's, it's a cool problem that is a cool answer. Sometimes you get one, not the other. I don't know. I don't know about that piece. All right. But here's what happens when you fiddle with this and you factor it all out. What was that? Always happens at that particular time? Let's try to simplify this out. What do we get here? I get n factorial, right? Plus, what do we get here? n choose 2 is n times n minus 1, right? right. Times n minus 2 factorial. So this is n factorial over 2 factorial. And the next one is n factorial over 3 factorial. Here's what you get n factorial, I missed one somewhere, hmm. what did I miss? I'm probably missing a term at the beginning here, let me, no, I don't think I did anything wrong, but something's wrong, I hate that. Well, let me see what I have so far. Here's what I have so far. I'm supposed to have a I'm supposed to have a 1 here, and all the minuses are going to be shifted over, so that would make this right, but I don't know why I lost my 1 here in front. What did I do wrong? My notes are wrong, too, so... You have a 1 minus 1 there is what you have. Where? 
Well, well, if you, you, factorial if you actually pulled the n factorial out of your, what you have up above that. Yeah, I know. Those cancel. I know. Yeah, right. I know, but I'm supposed to get an, n fact, an extra n factorial in here that I lost. I don't know where it went. I'm sorry. I goofed it up. Um, but where did it go? I mean, I should be able to... Let's, let's figure it out together. I hate to just leave this undone because it's a nice result. Let's, n factorial were known just n factorial is all the possibilities minus the possibilities where somebody gets their lunch back. Here the first person gets their lunch back. Here the second person gets their lunch back. Right? And I don't see anything wrong with that. Wait, the problem is that you've already subtracted this from n factorial, right? If, if you were still just working inside the... Oh, right. I subtracted it all. Right, right, right. I did, nothing's wrong. Sorry. Yeah. Nothing's wrong. But right. Yeah. Right. Nothing's wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm so happy. I didn't do anything wrong. I just subtracted earlier than I wanted to. This is the number. That's the number of derangements. And if I take that, this is the number of non-derangements. And if I take it away, I get the number of derangements. I think I did it right now. Good. Let's hope. All right, if you actually go ahead and calculate this, here's what you come out to get. And this goes back to calculus, and I won't go through the details. You can check your book for this. If you take the number of derangements and you divide by n factorial, that gets rid of this n factorial in here, you get just this funny looking fraction. And this funny looking fraction, as n goes to infinity, approaches 1 over e, or e to the minus 1. And you should kind of recognize why that's the case because of these because of these 1 over i factorials. All right, I'm not going to prove that to you, but you can check your book for the details of the proof of why it relates to e. I want to do, I still have a bunch to do today, and I need to keep you probably 25 more minutes. Uh, the, the derangements, this is the derangements, everything here. Okay, so if I d divide this through by n factorial, I get 1 minus this, it ends up being the same as 1 over e. Four pigeonholes and five pigeons, then one of the holes has two pigeons in it. Okay? If I have five cards and four suits, two of those cards are going to be the same suit. Okay? It's one of the key things in that problem set and that magic trick. We're going to do problems with the pigeonhole principle, not because it's a hard principle, but because it's sometimes incredibly deceptive. And these problems are very much on their own. They don't connect back into the other combinatorics, so I leave them in their own topic. But it's just filled with lots and lots of examples where you, know, you think you get the idea, and then somebody shows you a proof that uses nothing but that idea, and you just shake your head and say, how did I ever come up with that? And it's cool to see a simple principle being milked to its incredible potential. So that's what we'll do here. We'll start with easy ones. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six being the hardest. Here's A. Prove that two people in this room were born on the same day of the month, at least two. That means one through 31, you know, same. We got 36 people in this room, right? There's only 31 possible days. There's got to be a duplicate. OK, I'm the fourth. Oh, already? Oh, the act same. What's the chance of that? <laughs> That's a different problem. B. See? Only six. We're done with one. B. Prove that two people in the United States have the same number of hairs 
on their body. <laughs> We're going for the whole gusto here. <laughs> if you count all the hairs on a human body, it's nowhere near 250 million. It's a lot less. There's lots of people in the United States with the same number of hairs as somebody else. That's comforting. What's that? <laughs> That's comforting, right, right. And, 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 and we will have a little political caucus for all of those who have exactly 89,452 hairs in their body and see if there's anything in common with those people. Scary. C. All right, this is going to get a little bit harder. Uh, there's an exam that goes from 0 to 100 in score. You can get anything from 0 to 100. If I want to guarantee that three people will get the same score, I want to guarantee three people with the same score. How many people do I need to take the test? I need to guarantee three people with the same score. This is a little bit of an extension of the pigeonhole principle. I have 101 possible values that people can get, 101 boxes. I start throwing people into these boxes, and I'm trying somehow to guarantee three people in the same box. To guarantee three people in the same box, I've got to fill, in the worst case, two people in each box. There's 101 boxes. That makes 202. I can still set up with nobody getting, with no three getting the same score. The second I put in any number bigger than bigger than 202, there have to be three people with the same score. So how many people? Anything bigger than 202. Because we have 101 possible scores, and I can fill them up two per score without having anybody get three of the same scores, and that's 202 people. The second I add that last person, one of the holes gets filled too big. We need three people have the other right. Okay? Yep. Now, this is not a hard problem, but doesn't it make you pause longer than you think you should? It, it makes me pause longer than I think I should. I mean, I, I get the answer, but it takes me 20 seconds instead of two seconds. These take two seconds. So the next two are going to be even worse. Next three. 51 houses on a street. Their addresses are between 1,000 inclusive and 1,099. Okay, so every address on the street is something 1,000, 1,001, up through and including 1,099. 51 houses on the street. Prove there are at least two houses. with consecutive addresses. Okay, so there's two houses that are like 1,007 and 1,008. There's got to be two houses with consecutive addresses. There's 100 total addresses. If you figure, there's 100 total addresses. Consecutive address would be... There are only 51 houses. You can't make... Okay. They're all odd. Make all the addresses odd, and then you know there has to be one... Okay, so let, good. So, so, so let me describe how to say that idea in terms of pigeonholes. What are the holes here? The holes here are things that contain addresses. They contain pairs of addresses. There are 50 holes. Each contains two consecutive addresses. Okay, the first hole contains 1,000, 1,001. The next one contains 1,002 and 1,003. So I've got holes of consecutive addresses. What am I putting into these holes? Houses. Right, I've got 51 houses. I put the houses into these holes. I fill up all 50 of them. I've got one left. There's got to be two houses in one of these holes. 
How do I put the houses into the holes? I look at the address of the house. If its address is labeled on the hole, I put it in there. So I've got 51 houses. I can put the first 50 into 50 different holes, but when I get that 51st, it's going to have to go into a hole that already has another house in there. And those two houses that are in that hole have their addresses labeled on the hole, and the holes contain consecutive addresses. So those two houses will have consecutive addresses. There's a lot of elegance in these arguments, because it doesn't say which two houses have. It just shows you that there exist two that have to be consecutive. This is a very slick way of taking a problem that isn't obvious at all how to prove and turning it into a pigeonhole issue. Are there questions about this? Should I do this one again? What do I mean by a network? That means these computers are connected to other computers. Okay, so, so imagine that each of us are a computer, and you know, maybe I'm connected to Sham and, uh, and Jacob and, and Greg, and, and Joe's connected to Baruch, and Baruch's connected to Teresa. Okay, there's connections. Okay? So N computers on a network were connected in some way. I'm not telling you anything about how we're connected. Prove that at least two computers are connected to the same number of other computers. This is also very, very straightforward once you just think about it for a minute. Wait, what does it mean for a computer to be connected to the same number of other computers? That means if I'm connected to you and Baruch and Neil, and Sharon's connected to Chris, Peter, and Donna, we both connect to three computers. Okay? okay? How do you know there's at least two computers in the room that are connected to the same number of other computers? There's n computers in the room, right? How many different possible computers could we be connected to? I could be connected to one computer. I could be connected to two computers. I could be connected to n minus one computers. Every single computer in the world in, in this room could be connected to n minus one other computers in the room. So I make a bunch of holes. Each hole is labeled how many computers are you connected to? How many holes are there? n minus one holes. If you're connected to two computers, you go in this hole. If you're connected to n minus one computers, you go in this hole. But there's n computers in our room. So when I throw them into these holes, one of the holes has two computers in it. And those two computers are connected to the same number of other computers. This is actually from a graph theory question. Prove that you have a graph with n nodes, that there are going to be at least two nodes that have the same degree, the same number of edges connected to it. It's really a graph theory question. Yes, Brian? I'm just thinking this, this assumes that all the connections are two-way. That's right. It assumes, right, there are no directed connections here. Right. This assumes that you just make a wire, and, and which may not be realistic, but that's the assumption. And that you're not connected to, to yourself. yourself. Right. Because n has to be greater than n minus Right, zero. right. And that you're not connected. You, well, if you allow, then we don't include that in the, in the number. Right. Right. We don't count that. Exactly. All right, the next one's the most clever use. This one really is not at all apparent unless you think about it. And even after you think about it, it's not too apparent. But it's an excellent example. It's, I would say there are maybe a dozen good examples of really complicated uses of the pigeonhole principle, most of which are more or less alike. This is a canonical version of one of them. Okay? A lot of them are just like this. If you get this, you'll get the rest of them. So this is F. This is our last one, and after this, uh, I'll take a minute and, and summarize and finish up. This is what I call a really clever use. Clever. <laughs> and I got computers here, too, so I'm cooking with gas. Going down the baloney trail. I, <laughs> a computer goes down. At least one time every day. Okay, you got a computer every single day, it goes down at least once. That's given. You call it our network. Okay, it's <laughs> during a month. A 30-day month. Okay, only 30 days in a month here. During a month, it goes down 
it goes down at most 45 times. It can go down 45, but it won't go down any more than 45 times. Once a day, no more than 45 total during a 30-day period. Okay? That's all the information. Here's what we have to prove. Prove that this implies the following. It goes down exactly, exactly, not at least, but exactly 14 times in some consecutive period of days. Think about what this is saying for a second before we go ahead and prove it. The proof is not going to be hard, but it will be hard to find if I don't show it to you right now. Let's see what it's saying. It's saying a computer goes down once a day. There's no trick. It goes down at most 45 times in a 30-day period. Prove that you can find some consecutive sequence of days. And if you add up the number of times it goes down in that sequence, that'll be exactly 14. All right? So this is not, it is neither obvious nor unbelievable. I mean, this doesn't say all that much. It just means that somewhere in that 30-day period, I can find some consecutive peri period of days where if I add up the number of times it went down, it's 14. We're going to make a sequence starting from the first day of the month, counting how many times this computer's gone down. Okay? So if it's gone down three times in the first day, our sequence would start with three. If it's gone twi down twice in the second day, the next number in the sequence would be five. So if the number of times it's gone down, say, looks like this, then our sequence would be 1, 3, 6, 7, 8, 10. Everyone understand the sequence that I'm constructing? Okay. Now, I don't know anything about how many times it's gone down in each day, except that each day it's gone down more than once. So I don't know much about this sequence. Each day it's gone down more than once? Once or more. Okay. So let me tell you what I do know about this sequence I just described. Boom. The sequence has how many values in it? How many values in the sequence? 30. 30 values. What's the range of values? In the range, the, ra the smallest it could be is 1, and the biggest it could be is? It can be. It could be four. It's got, got to be forty-five, right? By the time I get to the end, I better have forty-five. Oh, at most forty-five. I take it back. But it could be forty-five at the end. What? Instead of at least thirty, and at most forty-five. No, it's got to have at least one at most thirty-five. The upper end. The range of any particular. I could have numbers as small as one and numbers as big as forty-five. This is all I can say about my sequence. I know it's got 30 values. I know if you look at each of the values, they could be as small as 1. They could be as big as 45. And you also know they're going up. Because every other day during that month has to have 1. Every day has to have a 1. Let's do a sequence. Here's a sequence. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Now do a sequence where the first one's 45. This is the sequence of how often the computers have gone down in day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And here's the sequence that I'm constructing. 1, 3, okay. 4, 6, 7, 9, etc. The cumulative sequence is what I'm talking about. Okay, so an element in that sequence can be as small as 1 and can be as big as 45. Okay. That's all I know so far. Everybody with me? Where are we heading here? Where does it go? It's almost there. I'm going to make a new sequence. All right, here's the number of times. Let's write the sequence down so everybody can see an example. One. Etc. 30 times. Now I'm going to make a new sequence. I'm going to add 14 to every one of these and make a new sequence. What's my new sequence? I'm adding 14 to each one. Jeez. That's, that's like, that's a, am I in the right place? Either the 39. 
Etc. All right, now I've got two sequences. This one's also 30 long, right? What is the range in this one? Fifteen to to fifty nine. Okay. What's the range in all of them all together? One through fifty nine. How many numbers are in these sequences? Sixty numbers in the sequence. I could have motivated this a little better to make it seem less magical, but I love the magic of this proof, the fact that it just creeps up on you and then you're done. Are you gluing those two sequences together? Yeah, here's one and here's another. I'm gluing them together at the end. So I got 60 things in my sequence, 59 possible values. That means that if I think of the 59 values as holes and these numbers as things I put into the holes, it means two of these numbers have to be identical. I got 60 numbers, I got 59 values. Can any of the numbers in this sequence be identical? No, because they go up by one each time, right? You've got to go down, the computer's got to go down once each day. This sequence repeatedly increases. This sequence repeatedly increases. I can't have duplicates in this sequence. I can't have duplicates in this sequence. Where is the duplicate going to have to occur? It occurs somewhere here and somewhere here. Presumably, further on here, we'd have a 15, and it would match this 15. Somewhere in this sequence is going to be a number that's the same as this sequence. What does that mean? Why is that? Let's make sure. Let's say that this is the 17th one here is the number 15. Okay? And the first one here... is number 15. Okay, let's say I get a duplicate there. I'm just to does that make, does that, let's not say it was 17 because that wouldn't be possible. 15 would be the first day. In this. All right, so let's, you're right, that's a bad example. Call it 12 or 10 or something. Let me do it this way. Say the ith day plus 14 equals the jth day. Say so that's where the duplicate occurs. That means between the i-th day and the jth day, between the jth day and the i-th day, we have a number of times the computer's gone down equal to 14. All right? This is a very, very slick proof and comes up out of nowhere. And how do you decide to construct these weird sequences where you get 59 different values and 60 possible numbers and just get that duplicate and that duplicate's going to be 14 apart, you know, because this problem is constructed backwards, right? I mean, you start with this and you work your way backwards and then you kind of hide it. But it isn't always obvious to solve a pigeonhole principle problem. And the good news is that they don't come up as often as the standard combinatorics problems. They come up, I'd say, one out of a hundred times rather than 99 out of a hundred times. But when you, they do come up, they're most often not this really clever, really neat way, but it's almost always you got five cards, four suits, you got two of the same suit. So appreciate the power of this principle. Don't, don't think it's just like nothing, but at the same time, be aware that these really clever versions, they do come up, but not as often as the basic combinatorial things that you'll have to work with. All right, so here's what we'll do in recitation. I'm going to finish up the onto functions. I'll have Tara do that. We can discuss this pr proof if you're interested. We can discuss any of the problems on problem set 5. I will today make sure the TAs post solutions for 5 and 4, make sure they're up there. And I will make sure that, um, <coughs> that I get problem set 6 up there so you can look at it if you want uh, over the weekend. Are there questions about anything?